Hey everybody, thanks for being here. This week we're winter steelhead fishing on the Quinault River in Washington and then the Siletz River in Oregon. Two rivers with effective broodstock programs. Now if you want to learn how to catch more fish, stay tuned. I'm Justin Wolf, and this is Angler West Television. This morning we're in the southwestern section of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington to target winter steelhead on the legendary Quinault River that flows within the Quinault Indian Reservation. We're with Steve Lynch and Jason Hambly of Procure, being guided by native guide, Rich Underwood. At a place called Chow Chow, it's about the eight mile mark of uh, 35 miles of private water. Uh, the eight mile mark is uh, the, the line for uh, the commercial. All the commercial nets are uh, below the eight mile mark. So anything above here is all uh, basically sport fishing, hook and lining, uh, subsistence and business. So today we're gonna uh, do a little bit of side drifting. There's some fresh fish that come in, and being this close to, to the salt water too is uh, kind of a kind of an advantage. I know there's a lot of fish up above, but uh, we have to kind of weed through them. So today I'm I'm kind of looking forward to catching some nice bright fish fresh out of the salt. I mean they're moving sea lice, and so we'll do we'll mix it up a little bit. Uh, side drifting, bobber dogging, and floats and jigs. Uh, maybe floats and eggs. We'll see how things go, but uh, certainly going to be a, a good day. All right. Way to go well, you know, sometimes, you know, you stir them up with them eggs and you get some bait out there, you get that scent trail going, especially some of that. Oh, uh, that's a huge, look at that. Oh. All right. You know, you get some of that uh, pro cure bait scent trail going down yeah. there. You know, it's no wonder the guy, the boat down below you, of course, we don't have to worry about that today, but. <laughs> You know, usually the guy down below you is going to reap the rewards of all the scent trail you got put on out there with that croak here. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> oh man. Oh, that's a nice fish, too. That's yeah. fresh. Yeah. We're only like seven miles from salt, so it's really, uh, these are all fresh. Yeah, I just keep pulling them up to the bow there and then turn them just at the last second. Got him. Nice. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's part of our broodstock. You know, the old, the old broodstock fish. Go ahead and bring that one in. You know, we we uh, prolonged our, our broodstock fishery to, you know, kind of coincide. And they got it down. I mean, we, we've had a manager up there for... Oh geez, 40, over 40 years. But that's that's what they raise. <laughs> yeah, here's one of the Quinault, Quinault River broodstock fish. You could tell because it's fin. But you know, here you got all the fins. But uh, you know, we're allowed to keep three, three fin fish. And uh, you know, these ones here, the average, well, they've been averaging around 14 pounds. So this one's probably pretty close to 14 pounds. You know, now that you felt it. Yeah, now that I picked <laughs> it up and held it. But uh, yeah, what an awesome fish. It's March and, and we're kind of getting into the, the mixed broodstock and, and still the wild. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit more of the wild steelhead come in. Uh, generally our season begins, winter on steelhead starts about late November. But generally most of the guys start in December and they run all the way through till end of March. Well, what's so special about this run is makes it unique is the fact that we uh, our hatchery programs we have we have two hatcheries on the Quinault River and we have another hatchery on a Queets uh, Salmon River hatchery, but today we we targeted those uh, those broodstock steelhead that were produced by our hatchery up at Amanda Park up in the lake Lake Quinault. <clears throat> See the the. Back in the day, about the late 50s, early 60s, they, the guides implemented the broodstock program, which enabled us to to hold on to those uh, ginormous genes. You know, it wasn't uncommon for 30, 40 pounders to be caught here on the Quinault River. Uh, there are stories even told of 50 pound steelhead caught on the Quinault. So they, they knew the importance of retaining those genes and holding them genes into the system. So they, the guides implemented the broodstock program for the hatcheries 
and then uh, of course we've had a hatchery manager that really really implemented the brood stock and, and built the resilience in these fish what we see today. Welcome back to the Quinault River. I'm Justin Wolf. Jason Hambly has landed our first fish of the day on a bobber and jig to hopefully kickstart a slow morning bite. But now it's lunchtime on the Quinault. Today we're going to have a little bit of elk burgers. I do most of my hunting myself or I get my nephews to hunt for me and you know most of the most of the guys that I that I have come up you know they really don't have access to, to a lunch and besides you know being on a river sometimes 30 40 days straight you get kind of tired of them cold cut sandwiches so uh, part of the program I started there a couple of years ago just having barbecue shoreside lunches and you know that's part of the part of what what I have to offer and you know most of the guys they, they come back not necessarily to fish anymore they come back to have the hamburgers <laughs> <laughs> well, another all that Well, we went down river and we fished for a while and we picked up a few down there and then we came back up to a spot, got a nice one earlier and flipped out a uh, Yakima bait jig head with a um, pink worm on the tail and had some shrimp krill super gel on it and it did the trick. I started in 1984 and it's a real special place. Um, you know, I remember a lot of the old timers back in the day and, and I can almost see them still. So it brings back a lot of memories. And, you know, my goal now is to, uh, not necessarily to promote my own business, but I'm, I'm really advocating the Quinault River and its tributaries. We have two river systems, the Queets and the, and the Quinault. <clears throat> so we've got a lot of, a lot of young men and young ladies who aspire to maybe get into the business one day. So uh, that's what I, what I try to do is, is promote the Quinault, promote the Queets, promote our resource, uh, just kind of share what we have and, and why it's so special. Uh, everything that we've done uh, today was created by those old timers back in the day. They had the foresight to, to look ahead 50, 60 years and, and realize that this was a, a resource that was worth hanging on to. So I really appreciate a lot of them old timers who left this for us. And in turn, that's what I want to do for, for the future of the Quinault people. Hey, hey, hey. Anyway, Steve. I love devil. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, look at this. Look at that beauty. Ooh. Here, I'll get it. You got the net? I got, I, go ahead and get the net. Here, go. Oh, nice. Okay, just flop it on the deck. And then get Steve. Cool. Good job, Jason. That's another. Oh, that's another. Lift up. Lift up. Oh, yeah, there you go. Nice. Two nice. bucks. Two bucks. Look at that. Two bucks. Just in time to. Oh, I think the magic Look at this. You know, two two nice bucks. You know, these ones here are, are you know a little smaller than than usual. Yeah. You know, so uh, you know they don't hurt to take these ones out of the system. Uh, when we brood stock, you know, generally we keep the the bigger fish. Sure. And these ones here aren't quite. They don't quite come up to snuff there, but. Uh, you know, still pretty nice for today's standards, you know, but here on the Quinault, we're, we're looking for that, the bigger one. Yeah, that's what it's known for, right? Yeah, the bigger fish. yeah in March, yeah, and that's what we're here for. I mean, as you can see, they're fresh, you know, they're, we're seven miles, seven and a half miles from the ocean, so, you know, things are uh, getting fresher and fresher, so the, the higher you get in the system, the, the darker these fish will be. Yeah. So no, it's kind of nice. No doubt, that's a pretty fish. Look at this one, still, right? still wants yeah. to go. You know, yeah. and, and we can't uh, 
can't stay it enough, you know, we're, we're still able to keep, even though this one's got all its fins, you know, we're still able to keep, uh, keep what they call a wild fish. And you're allowed three a day yeah, per person? Yeah, we're allowed three per person, yeah. That's cool. We came into the same spot and hooked up again, quick like a bunny. Making me work it, huh? Oh, I see how you are, Jason. Uh, you lift him up. I got him. There we go. While fishing the Quinault, stay at the Quinault River Inn. Go to QuinaultRiverInn.com for more information. So when we, uh, when we started the morning, we planned on hopefully getting some fish. And at the end of the day, once you do have your fish and you're ready to go home, it's always a good idea to get your eggs on cure before you leave. The nice thing is, is when they're still fresh, they'll take the cure a lot better. They'll color up a lot better. So to get that going, basically, once you land your fish, if it's a hen, it's a good idea to always bleed it out. As you can see, we bled it out and there's a majority of the blood is out of them, which is a good thing. You don't want too much blood in them. And once you're once you got your skein, what I generally will do is run a knife or a pair of scissors down the inside of the exposed portion, so it's more or less butterflying the skein open. And then once they're butterflied open to where they're nice and exposed, and all of the embryos on the back side that's still intact, what I'll do is I'll take it and I'll cut them into thirds. So there's those right there. It seems to help take the cure a little bit better. And the cure I'm running, I'm going to use today is the Fuse in the Steelhead blend. We're, we're in Steelhead season right now. We still got a little bit of the season left, so I want to get some good fresh eggs. So I'm just going to stick with that one. And basically what I'll try to do is, I'm not going to try, I'm going to try not to make a mess out of Rich's boat. So I'll just do them a couple skeins at a time, or a couple of chunks at a time. Put them in here. And then I usually use the sprinkle side. Put that in there and just put a fair amount in there, but don't go overboard with it. Roll them around a little bit. The steel head cure does not have any sulfites in it, so you don't have to worry about going too. You don't, you don't have to worry about burning the eggs, so if you go a little more cure than not enough, it's not a bad thing. When it gets in contact with the eggs, it's going to be kind of powdery for a little bit, but it, it juices up really good and it'll absorb into the eggs for sure. So once you got that, you got that cure in there, just zip them up and let them sit until you get home and then put them in a, in a more open container and spread them out a little bit more and then just keep letting them juice up for a couple days. And once they absorb all they're going to absorb and the curing process is done, just uh, lay them out, get all the juice off of them, let them air dry and then uh, stick them in a container and pour some uh, plain white borax on them and freeze them up and you're ready to go. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Now, Jason Hamley just showed you how to cure up your eggs with the ProCure Fuse Egg Cure, a powdered cure that's become very popular. Now, another product that ProCure puts out that I really like is the ProCure Liquid Egg Cure. Not only because it's simple, but because it's effective. If you've been watching the show for a while, you've seen a bunch of salmon and steelhead caught on this product. And it couldn't be easier to use. All you do is shake it up and pour it over your eggs. You've got your eggs in a plastic bag or a quart container. Let them soak for 10 or 12 hours. Maybe turn the eggs a few times during that time. And then spread them out and let them dry just like you would with the powdered cures. And then you're fishing. Now, let's go down to Oregon to the Siletz River, another fishery that's benefited immensely from an effective broodstock program. The Siletz River, a coastal stream just west of Salem, Oregon, winds for 67 miles over a distance of only 20 miles to Siletz Bay. 
Historically well known for its salmon and steelhead runs, the Siletz is also an example of a fishery that's been sustained by a successful broodstock program. Today, the Siletz Anglers Association held its first day on the water fundraiser to benefit broodstock programs. With some great raffle items, it looks like everyone had a good time at the event. So we are doing a Siletz Anglers Association. Our plan is to help promote and increase the broodstock program here on the Siletz River. And uh, we are going to do a lot of different things with the broodstock fish as far as hatch boxes, transportation boxes, acclimation ponds, that kind of stuff. So we just put an event together first year of the Sluts Anglers fundraiser to try to augment any of the places that uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife needs some extra funding to make our broodstock program better and back to normal. The day started early that morning. We're on the water with guide Grant Sheely. We're fishing the riffles today. The water's low and clear. And so they're not hiding out in the slow, clear water. They're looking for, it, it, it can be shallow. In fact, really shallow. The water we're in right now is only about two feet deep, but there's really good cover on it. It's got all kinds of riffles and they feel safe and hidden in there. And uh, that's where you'll find them in this kind of water, low, clear water. I wish somebody would hook one. Yeah, the water and air has gotten really cold this week, and so there's a chance they might start biting for us later in the day, because it's definitely cold out right now. Here's our basic setup, fishing three, four feet to our bobber stop up to the bobber. And then we go to a 3 8 ounce lead, and about three feet a liter to a yard ball that I put some Procure eggs on usually put some scent in it the night before. Put in the egg loop, sit your down, nice little ball, you don't need much. So when the river's low and clear, you're only fishing the faster, quicker water, so you don't need a great big bobber. So I'm just using the Fish Field Pro Dogger in the medium size, and it, it drags it down the river just right. Fish on. It's bound to happen. Get a little bend in that rod, Bob. Lift her up. You know a net, Jim? Trying to keep your net? I'm gonna go beaches. Nice keeper. What? Nice keeper. Nice broodstock fish. Welcome back to the Siletz River. I'm Justin Wolf. We're with guide Grant Sheely along with Robert Smith and Jim Huddleton. The cold, low, and clear conditions have made today's fishing a challenge, but we've landed a fresh broodstock fish that will be great eating and is a product of the River's Broodstock Program. Look at that. Long-tailed sea lice. This is a fresh one. This is the first fish with sea lice we've caught in a couple weeks. Bob hooked it good. Nice job, Bob. So in the Siletz Winter Steelhead, the hatchery fish are identified, they obviously take off the adipose, but they also take off the left maxillary right there. You can see it's completely missing. Bob spins that around, you can see an intact maxillary bone. And that is completely removed on the left side. Just for the winters, the summer steel, they don't remove that. In fact, they quit doing that last year. The baby steelhead that went out are no longer max clipped at all. So hitting their gills is a very effective way to bleed them. The problem is when I go to clean the fish, its tongue will be exposed and it cuts me up. So I don't actually just cut right in here, hit the aorta, and it bleeds them really good. Never touch the gills or open up the mouth where the tongue has all the teeth. 
pretty effective way. Yeah, there's two really nice fish in there. They, uh, this is the cage we use to, we put them in here in the, as long as you're signed up, we don't want to do this. If we're not signed up because the state police will not think kindly of it, but, uh, we drop them in here. We call this, the local ODF and W out of Newport and they come pick them up in their truck. Um, and they haul them to the, actually the Alsea hatchery on the North Fork Alsea. And that's where they, they bring them up through egg stage and bring them up to small size. They fin clip them and at a year old, they drop them up upstream and those go out to sea for a couple of years and they come back that's what we catch and keep it's our opportunity in this river uh, without that there's just not enough natives plenty of natives in the river but there's not enough to maintain a catch and kill fishery so this takes a lot of pressure off the natives we take a couple for broodstock reasons to, for for eggs and babies and then uh, then we can come back and catch and keep like today we only caught one nice hatchery fish but there's somebody caught a couple nice natives and put them in here and it's, uh, it's a good good circle of life for us here. So the reason we take broodstock fish is back in the olden days, if you will, 20, 25 years ago, we they would take out of, out of basin steelhead, which is on this river, they were Alsea River fish. Well, those fish over the millennia are not, they don't survive well in the Silettes. And they brought back little raggy fish and so they're bringing in genetics off the river these fish come back just like our big fat natives do. They're beautiful fish. Um, and if they do figure out how to spawn in the wild, they're not going to be spawning with a native that has different genetics. They're supposed to be here. They're going to survive better on the Silettes because they've been here forever. Um, it's been a really neat system because then we have fish to catch and eat, which is really nice because we're Oregonians. We like to catch and eat steelhead. The broodstock program has been working pretty dang good for us for the last 20 years here. They started in 96. Um, we're, our goal with our today's broodstock fundraiser is we want to make sure our hatcheries have all the whatever they need to function properly. But our goal after that is to help uh, other broodstock programs all around the state. They're all struggling financially, so we're hoping to raise money so all the rivers can have good broodstock programs. That is, that is ultimately our goal, to spread the wealth. Thanks for watching today's episode. You know, without the support of the sponsors, there would be no show. So please thank them when you can. Now, get out there and do some great fishing.